Hello and welcome to The Good Council, the podcast of the World Future Council. In each episode, we'll highlight current challenges and policy solutions. And we'll also take you on a journey of inspiring stories, listening to another of our intergenerational dialogues from around the globe. Hello everyone, my name is Annika. I'm working at the World Future Council. In this episode, I'm speaking with Angelina Davidova, a renowned journalist, civil society expert, educator and change maker with more than 20 years of experience in Russian and international media, international non-governmental organizations, think tanks and academia. She's regarded as an expert in Russian climate and environmental policy, green civil society initiatives and grassroots movements. She currently writes for publications such as Commerzant, the Thomas Reuters Foundation, Klimaretter.info, the Science Magazine, and she's also the main editor of the journal Ecology and Law. Hello, Angelina. Thank you so much for being here today with me. It is a real pleasure for me to speak with you and to get to know you a little bit better. Hello, Annika, and uh, thank you for having me. Because our listeners and readers probably don't know you yet, I was just going to ask you, if someone wrote a biography about you, what would it say who you are and where you come from? Well, I come from St. Petersburg, Russia, which was called Leningrad at the time that I was born. And I like making this joke saying that I was born in a city and I was born in a country which do not exist anymore. So I was born in Leningrad, Soviet Union, and now it's in Petersburg, Russia. Um, I studied economics, but then I went into journalism and I worked many years in journalism. uh, And I still do that now as a freelance author for a number of publications, which you mentioned. But other than that, um, around 12 years ago, I discovered the topics of climate change and sustainable development and environmental cooperation. And I felt like those were very important topics for me personally, but also for the world on a global scale. And um, I got very interested and I got very excited. And when I get really interested into something, I just go and explore the field. And uh, this is what I did. And um, so at this very moment, um, I'm active in a number of sectors, which you mentioned. I write, I speak, I educate, I'm active in international cooperation programs. I'm trying to learn many things about the world. I'm trying to learn the way the world is in various diverse aspects of this world. Problems, solutions, what we can do, what is being done already, what works, what doesn't work. And that I'm trying to pass this information along in various forms, in forms of educational materials or media products or something else, like our conversation is probably also one of these formats. And um, I'm also connecting a lot of people together, like to speak about, I don't know, maybe my life's mission. I always feel like um, if I'm being asked about how is that I see myself, I would probably say, on one hand, I'm really learning about the world and um, spreading this information around. On the other side, I'm also someone who connects a lot of people. Like I know a lot of people and many people know me. So I feel like it's very important to get people connected, but also somehow to make the whole communication smoother. So to moderate the meetings, talks, be it offline or more often online now. How was your childhood and how has that made you who you are today? Well, I grew up in a country which was changing on a daily basis like something which we believe to be true one day was not true the next day. And uh, I believe uh, we had to adapt to these changes. And on one hand, I feel like I was growing up thinking nothing is forever and everything will change tomorrow. So uh, you have to be flexible, you have to be resilient. I didn't know the word resilient then. I I guess it didn't exist in my world. And um, you have to, I don't know, be able to change. On one hand, it does bring a lot of flexibility. And uh, I feel like, say, I'm always learning. I'm always learning something new. Um, On the other hand, it certainly brings along issues of trust. Like, who do you trust and what do you trust? Do you trust any institutions at all? How do you trust people? 
Uh, those are still very important issues, not only for me personally, but I feel like many people in my country and especially people of my generation or around. So I would say those particular historic conditions obviously shaped me in the way I am now. Now speaking more about um, personal um, experience, I've always loved reading and I used to read a lot when I was a kid. I also used to invent a lot of stories. We actually used to play that game with my mom when she would start a story, like a fairy tale. But those would be sometimes fairy tale about, I don't know, various very practical aspects of life. For example, a fairy tale about a plumber who we saw out of the window. And so she would start the story and then I was encouraged to continue the story and think of something happening. And uh, I still love that. Even though I don't write fiction and I don't produce fiction, well, maybe one day I will, uh, but it's still something which I enjoyed a lot. And then um, I also remember in our summer house, like our dacha outside of Leningrad, um, we also had a lot of world maps where various countries and continents were portrayed. And I would travel through them with my eyes thinking, oh my God, maybe one day I'll go to Africa or to South America and elsewhere, because I was out there somewhere up in the north <laughs> in a very little spot. And uh, I'm very happy that until the COVID, I got the chance to travel to many continents and many places in this um, little round planet and got to see with my own eyes the way people live. Because even though I work in journalism, I very often realize how international journalism is somewhat limited in portrayal of the ways of life of people, like common people like you or I or that plumber who we can see out of our window. It's very often that we tend to read stories about important people, presidents, queens, celebrities, and not enough stories about just the way people live, what makes them happy, what's their regular life is built around. And uh, this is very often, you can only really see with your own eyes when you come to a place and then when you speak to the people you see there, and then you build your own story. It might not be 100% true story because you only see and you only get to know particular aspects that you are interested in and then you still frame them with your uh, brain which might also have stereotypes or frameworks that you prefer to use but it's still I feel like it's an it's an enriching experience. So uh, I take it you've visited many many countries then do you have a rough idea how many? <laughs> Actually I didn't count them. I don't know, maybe something between 30 and 40. Around 30, I guess. Yeah. That's really impressive. So how does how does uh, today's Angelina look back at, at uh, child Angelina? What has come true and, and what were your expectations? And did you think it would ever be, it, it would be like you think it would? Well, when I was a child, I even thought that the year 2000 is not real, you know? It seemed so far away. In a way, I don't feel like I was making plans or I was planning my future in a very distinct way. I thought that there are things that I want to do, there are things that I'm interested in, but I guess I didn't have very specific plans, like I want to grow up and be that. I actually didn't know who I want to be. Even now, it takes me quite a while to explain what is actually that I'm doing because I'm doing so many things. Uh, maybe there is no word for my profession. Maybe the whole idea of profession is going into the past and we are now being defined by something else. So um, yeah, I feel like um, I didn't have any specific plans. Looking from my childhood experience to the way I am now, um, I would probably say um, I'm, I'm happy with what I am. I mean, there's still a long way to work on myself. There's still a long way to explore myself and uh, find out new things in life I'm interested in, but also find out new ways of taking care of myself and uh, um, yeah, exploring this world. But in general, um, I would say looking at uh, the little girl which was out there in our um, summer house and our dacha uh, and if she were to talk to me now I believe that would have been an interesting conversation and a mutually um, encouraging and um, 
a happy conversation. That's really, really lovely. Um, and I'd love to come back to some of the, the things you, you addressed. Um, one of them is that you say you're still perhaps searching for what it is that you want to be doing and doing with your life. Um, you did study at St. Petersburg University uh, economics and finance, but then you switched to journalism. Is that maybe another facet of always reinventing yourself and looking for something else or was there another reason how you came to to become a journalist well at that time i was not framing it that way now maybe if i look back i would use exactly the same wording uh, like you just did um with me i was somehow always following my um, inner call i would say um i was always someone who could not spend who could not imagine spending a year doing something which I would not enjoy. Um, so for me, I was always like, uh, there's nothing that I should be doing or I must be doing. There's only something which I want to be doing. And um, that has um, pluses and minuses <laughs> now that I think about it. I mean, um, I never worked in an, um, hierarchical structures. I never, I don't believe in hierarchies. I, I believe in teamwork and I believe in partnerships. In partnerships. Um, I uh, never really worked like 10, nine to five jobs or 10 to eight or 10 to six, which is more common here. Um, I was always someone who felt like I want to define what I do and how I do. And I want to, if I get passionate about something, I do that. However, that also has another side which means the whole division between work and non-work disappears. In a way, I work all the time. <laughs> and, uh, well, I don't always define it as work. Like, for example, what is it that we do now, right? Is it work? Is it not work? I enjoy it. It's interesting. Luckily, I have a colleague helping me, and we are here at the office of the Bilona, which is an NGO based in St. Petersburg, and I'm working with them, and they are the ones who publish this magazine, Environment and Law, which I edit. And I'm very happy I have colleagues helping me. So, uh, but in a way, that leads to the fact that, say, two days on this week, I was working until midnight. And um, some other days I have to get up very early and do something. It's always like there are, it's very hard to say no to exciting things, <laughs> but maybe I should start learning more. So the whole work-life balance is an issue, is an issue for my, so to say, mode of life, which I shaped. So now I start to think more about the balance, more about other things, because I want to do so many other things in life. I want to join the choir again. <laughs> I did it so many times in my life and I just dropped out because sometimes when you have an event in the evening, what, you miss it, right? And people cannot rely on you. And likewise, I would love to do more dancing. I would love to do other things, but um, yeah, it's, it's not easy. So, but I'm trying to, um, to think and to feel how is it I can, I can change my life. It's uh, very uh, reflective for me actually listening to you. It's almost like listening to a mirror. <laughs> I relate to so much that you're saying. <laughs> so since we've just spoke a lot um, about work and you also mentioned your work-life balance, what is it that you, that you hope to achieve with the work that you do? Um, here, once again, I would say I don't always have very particular goals. And this is probably one of the specifics of living in, um, in our times, in modern times, in, in Russia as it is. Like planning exists, but it almost never comes to life. <laughs> so uh, in a way, um, I feel like I'm doing what I can and I'm trying to do it better and better. I'm also trying to learn something new meet new people, uh, develop more profound and more uh, mutually interesting, exciting and beneficial working companionships with people and organizations. And I just see what comes out of it. Like one of the factors which certainly worked over the last, I'd say, 10 years is that I've been and I'm still one of the people who's been putting climate agenda in Russia forward. And uh, I would say here, I would also say not only me, but also a number of us, right? People 
who are part of the um, climate circles, as we say, in Russia, we really, we put that agenda forward. Now climate is an important issue. Everyone talks about it. There are probably every week, there are like one or two climate and decarbonization related events. Probably out there, there's someone like a very, very tiny uh, percentage that um, I've contributed to that factor by writing about it, by giving public lectures, by talking to people, by bringing all these people together and facilitating a conversation between them. So that would be like one of the things that I would mention. And then another, um, another thing that I would also mention is that, as you said in the beginning, I'm also very active in the area of international cooperation. And I believe in international cooperation. I mean, these days, uh, probably it has always been the case, but I live now, so <laughs> I speak about the present. Um, there are so many bad news about uh, international cooperations, political complications, economic sanctions, economic uh, conflicts, many other aspects. And uh, mostly of what we read in the media is about this. However, I still, I strongly believe that uh, aside from that, there are still tracks for other kinds of cooperations. Because very often it's the government or political or economical elites which bring countries into this. And they don't take into consideration common people. They don't take into consideration people like you or me who are working for a particular cause or engaged in a particular area. And we do want to develop international cooperation on our fields. Not about, I don't know, military aspects, not about many other aspects, but about the areas where we work in. And I feel it's still important to sustain that level of cooperation, no matter what. It's still important to talk to each other and try and think about what is it that we can do. That's really important, especially right now, as you said, when it almost feels like international cooperation is somewhat going, going downhill almost. Um, but this, this again ties in with you, the networker in a way, um, the person who brings people together and who, who looks out for new contacts. And I guess one of the new um, sort of networks that you're part of now is, is the World Future Council. Um, you're a very recent councillor. Um, you joined just at, I think at the begin, um, end of last year, 2020. Um, what, what brings you to us? I mean, we're, we're super excited to have you and I'm super excited to learn from you today. Uh, what, what brings you to us? Well, first of all, I would like to say it has been a great honor when I have been invited to become a counselor. And um, I looked up at the uh, list of the current counselors and I looked up at the events and other activities of the council and I realized, wow, it's such an amazing institution. It's very interesting what they do. They bring together many exciting people. Uh, like the level of discussions, the level of publications is indeed very professional and I want to be part of that network. So I've been invited. I said yes, I joined and uh, I've participated in a number of um, events which were organized. I believe we, so far we just had one big talk among all counselors and the next one is coming soon. And I look forward to our real meeting, hopefully uh, in the fall um, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, I mean, so far all the activities which have been done by other counselors, uh, the ones I read about, the ones I listen to, I've been to a number of events, like online events organized by other counselors. And I also regularly read all the papers and uh, like research projects produced by other councils. And that all sounds very exciting to me. I've, um, I'm about to launch my podcast, um, which will be called Posli Zavtra, so the day after tomorrow. Uh, the podcast is supported by the Goethe Institute in St. Petersburg. And for one of the podcast episodes, which is due to come out in late April and early May, I've actually in interviewed um, Hans Hern, uh, one of the um, councillors and one of the uh, World Future Council members. And uh, that has already been a very um, exciting cooperation outside the, the usual meeting track. And I look forward to further cooperation with other members. And uh, yeah, it looks like a very interesting institution. It looks like a very interesting track. 
and a very interesting forward-thinking um, organization. I'm somehow very, well, I can, I can probably say, I don't know if the word progressive is um, positive these days, <laughs> but I would call myself someone uh, who very much likes looking into the future, thinking what the future could be, uh, what is it the future we want to be, and um, I feel like engaging in these kinds of conversations about future is always something which excites me. I like thinking about future and I'm a very like future oriented person. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity and I'm very grateful that I've been invited. And now I'm now part of the World Future Council. Oh my God, that sounds so serious as well. <laughs> I really look forward to listening to your podcast when it's out. So um, just briefly, maybe, how is it um, that you, you look to um, use your skills and ideas and your work um, within the council and how can also the Work Future Council help you amplify your work and, and achieve your goals? Well, I feel like it's still being formed, like there are no set like forms of cooperation, but from what I have seen so far and I have heard and read so far, I would be open to engage in um, uh, public events organized by the World Future Council, which are dedicated to my area of expertise. I would be open to any sort of uh, bilateral or multilateral cooperation projects with other councillors. Um, I'm sharing everything I do through the uh, council's mailing list, and sometimes I think maybe it's, it's a bit too much, <laughs> but I'm still doing it. And I like learning about what other members are doing. So in a way, a lot of exchange, a lot of cooperation, uh, very particular um, educational and public awareness projects that we can do together. I'm always happy to speak at the World Future Council events and uh, share my expertise and my knowledge of the areas and the region where I'm from. So I look forward to many forms of engagement and I believe Right now, at the times when most of life and activities are online, we kind of have to rethink about what international cooperation is at these difficult times. And uh, many new forms can appear. And uh, we are watching them appearing and being born. Wonderful. And, um there's there's one thing that I'd really uh, love to ask you about, which is since you're a journalist, uh, the other huge thing obviously is that nowadays almost everyone can become a journalist, right? And I mean specifically social media and fake news. What does that do to you? And what what do you think about um, yeah the phenomenon that everyone can just pick up a microphone, uh, write about something they're interested in, and put it out there? Whereas journalists really go through all the motions and fact check, make sure what they're saying is accurate. What, what do you think about that? Well, I see both positive and negative consequences of that trend. On the positive side, um, it did become much more democratic in a way and inclusive in a form that everyone can now be... Uh, I mean, they used to say this um, like civic journalism uh, a few years ago. I believe now they don't use that term that widely nowadays. But yeah, everyone now can be a civic journalist. Uh, like with what you do, with what you write in your social media, with what you post or repost, uh, like creating media content or sharing media content, you're already contributing to to the global media world. And uh, it's it's good in a way. Uh, now, the negative consequences are obviously uh, like the ones you mentioned, that it's very often that people now and audiences now uh, find it more and more difficult to differentiate between professional uh, media specialists and uh, non-professional media specialists. And people just say things like, oh, it has been written on the Internet or like I saw it on Facebook or on Twitter. And... Uh, not many people really go deep down about where this information appeared, who was the origin of it, how do I make sure it's correct, how do I make sure it's authentic, like what are the proofs, what does the other side says. So in a way, all these questions referring to uh, fact-checking, to uh, bring proofs of your information, to bring in opinions of the other sides, that's not always there. 
and in a way that changes um, the way people consume information because now we have so much information in various forms around us there's a lot of noise so to say right informational noise and there's a lot of buzzing around and uh, it's really hard to uh, pick out particular uh, news outlets and pick out particular media products uh, which you can trust I mean, nowadays, uh, like for, for us media professionals, it might be a bit easier, but I often think about people who are not uh, that experienced also with social media and then tend to believe many things which are written or said or um, uh, otherwise represented uh, in various social media formats. And then it's really difficult to differentiate. It's really difficult to find out what's really happening. So, uh, yeah, I would say both positive and both negative consequences of that. And does it have any direct impact that you feel uh, it has on your work? Um, well, on one hand, um, I feel like I need to promote my work. And now promotion of what you do is as important as creating original media product. So the times when you write an article and then it, it was like, wow, and everyone read it and everyone paid attention to it, are gone. I mean, unless probably you write about some really important political issues. But if you really want to bring attention of the audience to your subject, you have to invest either you or your colleagues. Someone has to invest a lot of in promotion. Like you really, you have to knock on the... Uh, on your audience door and say, look, this is an amazing story. Um, I very often try and do it through my personal um, attitude saying, look, it's me. I do this. I came to learn about the story. I did this research. I spoke to those people and to those people and I went there maybe and uh, I produced the story. And um, but yeah, so you have to react and you have to promote a lot of what you do. And then you also, and then another open question is to what extent should you really react to everything happening in social media and um, engage in conversations? I actually, a few years ago, I used to be much more active on social media, like Facebook and Twitter, um, like posting my materials and answering all the comments and engaging in long conversations or then writing my general thoughts about what's happening in the sector that I'm active in. Uh, and then after a while, it became so much. It just became too much for me. And I realized I want to do a bit less of it. And probably now I'm having it in a more professional way and I'm engaging in less conversations in social media than before, simply because I do not have enough time. Like 24 hours are certainly not enough for that. But it's still an open question, especially if you don't work for a large professional media, but you work for a number of media and you are the one who has to do everything. Um, I mean, say in case of our magazine, uh, luckily there are professional people who do this. But then sometimes when I write for other media and I want to publicize my stories for the more general audience, I have to invest a lot of time and energy in promoting it and also engaging with the audience. Um, and this is, uh, this is very time consuming. I mean, on one hand, it does bring you closer to your audience. On the other hand, yeah, time, time, time is the greatest uh, resource of our lives now. Yeah, that's true. And I guess that also ties in again with the work-life balance that you mentioned before. Social media has almost made it even more difficult to sort of have that clear separation between the professional and the private life. and. There's just always something to be done, like around the clock, I guess, especially as a journalist, you must be feeling that. Right. Even when I come to a party or like to a dinner and I meet new people and they don't know what I do. As soon as I mention this, they start asking me questions about recycling or the waste management reform or forestry or wildfires. And I feel like <laughs> people, honestly, I came here just to have fun. But because the topic is becoming so important in Russia and almost everyone is interested in this, you say environment or climate and people start asking you questions about that. So in a way, there's no rest. <laughs> yeah, that's something I'm definitely going to ask you about in a minute. Um, but first, again, in the term, in, in the um, 
topic of networking and institutions in the beginning you said um, the way you were brought up and and the environment that you were raised um, has certainly um, made you question trust in institution and, and stuff um, you are also observing in in your work um, UN climate conferences since 2008 right um, how do you reconcile this belief in international cooperation um, but the not suspicion but certain um, just critical view on on institutions and just the trust in it how, how does that work out well i believe uh, in engaging with the unfccc like being an observer since 2008 taught me to be patient taught me to be um, patient about immediate results and immediate success. Uh, in my everyday life, I meet a lot of people and also many of my students ask me, why is it that UN cannot tell countries to protect environment, to, I don't know, protect human rights, to do other things? And I'm telling them, look, the UN is not telling anyone to do anything. The UN is a platform where countries meet and then decide collectively on something. I also always bring in an example. Imagine there are like 30 of you out in the in the room. And if you had to agree on a text, which would be just a page long, just imagine how many hours and days you would spend doing it. And here at the level of the UN, there are so many underlying um, issues, uh, underlying or real conflicts, historical issues, contemporary issues, trade issues, who is doing more, who is more to blame, and it's like, this is why it's so slow. So in a way, um, from my experience at the UN, I realized on one hand that it's a very slow process and it really takes a lot of time to change something at this you know, large international level. Um, on the other hand, um, it also made me, I feel like maybe a bit more realistic seeing that okay there are certain things which will not change for a while maybe there are some things which will not even change during my lifetime but to accept them to say yes the way things are the way they are now what is it that i can do what is it and how is it that i can change the situation and then try and think more in practical terms about um how can i change something and uh there, I believe I've also seen amazing and very inspiring examples of particular people or communities or cities or companies changing the world, maybe the micro world, the world around them, but still doing a lot. All these amazing stories of um, new technologies, new social technologies, new ways of, um, I don't know, treating issues like sustainable development or climate resilient uh, climate resilient forestry, climate resilient agriculture, new attitudes to what uh, urban planning is. Very often it comes from very particular cases when someone is willing to change something and they're trying it at their micro level. That can be activism, that can be a social entrepreneur, that can be a group of female farmers somewhere. So um, it, it varies, but then you see this very little examples and you think, okay, so there are many ways you can, um, I wouldn't even say here change the world because it may sound too, too big, uh, but there are many ways in which you can behave yourself in this world. Uh, you can go for larger structures and try to think the large overarching structures which are out there. You can go and do something very down to earth, uh, something grassroots and change the world around you. So there are many ways of engaging with this world. And uh, yeah, so I believe my experience, as I mentioned, taught me to be patient. It also showed me the um, greater diversity of the world out there. And um, yeah, so in a way I did not become a more pessimistic person, I would say. That's again, fascinating. Um, I think I might be just uh, repeating the same thing again and again, but I really am learning so much uh, from you. And I just find it fascinating as well to hear your, your observations on that, especially because just in the beginning you said, um, you know, you wouldn't want to do 
any job for over a year if you didn't truly really enjoy it. But then the experience with the UN and, and conferences is that you have to be really patient. It's almost the direct opposite. Um, <laughs> I guess that's, that must have been quite a change, wasn't it? Right. And I have to say, in my normal life, I'm not a very patient person. <laughs> so it was always something like, yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> you leave and you change and you discover something else about yourself, which is, which is fine, I guess, which is your path. Although, isn't it frustrating to have this realization, perhaps at some point, that some things will not even change in one's lifetime? I mean, I'm still a little bit younger than you and I still, you know, have this naive belief I can, whatever I set out to do, um, me and my generation, we will be able to, to change that. Well, I feel like uh, maybe at my current stage and um, I can change tomorrow. So I will just speak about today. Maybe in my current stage, um, I'm trying to reach a... Um, condition and a state where I would just accept the way things are, uh, realize that there's something which is being done which is good, something which is being done which is bad. Sometimes things which are being done under the good names bring very bad results. That also happens. So in a way, the world is not easy and the world is not linear and the world is not just black and white. The world is complicated and interconnected so in a way I'm just trying to accept it the way it is and just see what is it that I can do and not to worry about things that I don't have any uh, impact on or any influence on they can be bad they can be very sad but then I acknowledge them but then I feel like it's important for me not to go too deeply emotionally into that and just see where is that area that I can uh, bring the best of me and do that there. I don't know, maybe you can call it a Buddhistic approach. I'm not a practicing Buddhist, uh, but uh, um, maybe it's something about that. Or maybe it's something, I very often read similar ideas in the so-called post-Jungian psychology. So that would be also something from there but I would not like to refer to any particular line of thought or philosophy or religious th thread so to say that I'm following here once again I, I read and I'm open to many things and I'm just trying to see how it resonates within me that exactly brings me to one of the questions <laughs> I, I had thought of before because um, because you just mentioned it so uh, the world is so complex so interconnected and sometimes it feels um, like there's just not enough time or we just can't bring about change. Um, and I think maybe there's a danger in just not doing anything at all. Obviously, you're not doing that. You are very much bringing about change and seeing to it that whatever you can do, you will do it. But what's what would be your advice um, for just fellow human beings um, who may just feel a little bit overwhelmed by the challenges of our time. I'm, I'm usually very cautious in giving advice because I also feel like everyone is so special and everyone has very different life conditions and maybe I have been privileged in so many other aspects in this life that other people have not. Um, but I still feel like um, it's important to take care of yourself in the first place and uh, make sure you have enough energy and enough resources. Um, it's also important to uh, develop uh, various uh, relationships with people around you. Uh, partnerships, work-related relations, friendships, um, family relations, many kinds of relations. Because, um, I don't know, from my experience, uh, working with people and engaging in networks is the crucial thing uh, that we have in life. And it's with people, even though sometimes it's also challenging, but it's still, it's with people that you can achieve something which you would not have achieved on your own. On, I mean, it's much more fun sometimes just to be on your own and do your own things and be independent. But then it's almost like 
I sometimes feel working with people and working with teams and also going through conflicts and through conflict resolutions and trying to build a common vision. This is something which obviously worth investing your time, your energy, and once again, your patience. <laughs> so I somehow speak a lot about patience. It's almost like a therapy session with you. <laughs> So yeah, taking care of yourself, building relationships with people, building networks, um, being open, being flexible. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably something else would come to my mind later, but I would, I would stop here now. No, that's that's really good, and uh, yeah, it's a great therapy session. <laughs> um, so let's move on to um, another topic, Russia. Your, uh, your home country. Uh, I saw another interview with you in which you said that uh, in international news, and it's again something you had mentioned at the beginning of the interview, that you read a lot about um, Putin and the Kremlin and, and just politics, but very little about the everyday life of people. So if you now had your own international media, your own international news outlet, what is it that you would like to be written about? Uh, Russia and Russian people? Well, I would say more long reports in various forms, like textual, video, audio, of life of people all across the country. Just going to places, going to distant places, talking to people, seeing the way they live, spending weeks there, trying and getting into um, the fabric of life i don't know i somehow had this this word in my my mind and uh, not making any immediate conclusions not jumping to any um judgments but just long stories <laughs> would probably be boring now that i think about it and uh, this is also something which i really uh recently realized uh, I disagree more and more. You know, like in um, regular journalistic courses or media courses uh, or everywhere, they always tell you that for journalistic uh, material to be, for journalistic media content to be exciting and interesting, you have to have a conflict. You have to have a villain and a hero. You have to have um, dramatic structure developing. You have to have you know, like all these various structures of drama and conflict developing. And I was recently speaking at an environmental journalism seminar and um, uh, the other speaker, he was a journalist uh, producing um, documentaries and uh, TV productions also about environmental topics. And he was also speaking about that. And um, I realized that somehow I almost feel like our current world is going beyond that uh, in many ways, in terms of politics, societies, but also ethics, in many other ways. We are going beyond the usual conflicts. We are going beyond the usual story structure. We are going beyond the usual villain and heroes. Uh, who is a hero? Is it someone achieving for himself or his family? Or is he taking into consideration everyone's opinion and just caring? Do we have heroes who are just caring about people? And in a way, I felt like I have a lot, um, well, I would not say against because I'm not actively fighting. I'm actually doing nothing with that respect. But there's something within me which does not agree to this established structures of black and white, villains and heroes, drama and conflict. I almost feel like I want to have more depictive and descriptive um, stories which just take place as life and which just shows you through a very tiny hole in your camera uh, the whole diversity and variety of the world without any making any judgments or any connecting, not connecting to anything else, just showing it to you in a in the way sometimes art does or uh, visual art does or sometimes you have such art house movies where you know nothing happens <laughs> i love them <laughs> what is one thing that you would like the world to know about russian people oi it's um oi you know it's a very common scene in russian when something uh 
like startles you or something you are being surprised by something or then also if you are thinking about long and difficult topic and uh, you feel like oi <laughs> that's a very russian saying um uh <laughs> or like there's no one thing um okay what is it uh that um uh, russians as well as um many other people all over the world they they're not um Aliens, they're not extraterrestrials, uh, they're not different. Uh, countries can be different. People very often are much closer to each other than we think. And um, the stories which I heard in uh, bars in New York and Berlin are not that different to the ones you hear in, in the bars of St. Petersburg or Moscow when you speak about everyday lives. So I would say, yeah, I mean, nothing super exciting. <laughs> Uh, but um, beautiful stories and uh, uh, it's very often that you have to go outside of the beaten track, go somewhere very far away or sometimes also not very far away, just sit in a bar and listen to other people talking or um, I don't know, do it elsewhere. Yeah, well, people don't talk in the library, so where else would you hear them talk? <laughs> That's a good question now. Uh, sometimes on a bus or yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if it's not a very exciting answer, but that's the one I have. <laughs> no, I just uh, I just see um, I, I've just found another fellow people watcher who likes to do that. <laughs> um, Ex ah, you're also a people watcher. Yes, I, I love to just observe people and um, see what because I'm always wondering, you know, even when you're driving on a highway or something and you see like hundreds of cars and you're just like, where are these people? Where are they going? Uh, who are they and and what's their thing in life it's just so many many stories and and i think you're absolutely right sometimes we tend to forget that there's much more that connects us um that the things that we try and separate us so it's a beautiful answer thank you <laughs> um just to stay on the um avenue of stereotypes though <laughs> i'm curious what is one myth um, that people have about Russia, which you would like to rebut? We don't say Nazdorovye when we toast, when we say cheers. No, we do not say Nazdorovye. <laughs> That's 100% Hollywood. That's like 100% Hollywood. We usually say to what exactly we're drinking, like to our meeting, to, I don't know, to our health, to our, well, to health actually means Nazdorovye, but no, we don't say this. To to our friendship, to our love, to future, like to many other things. But Nozdorovia is maybe, I don't know, 19th century and Hollywood. <laughs> I remember when I was at a COP um, in Paris, so U United Nations Climate Conference in Paris, where Paris Agreement was approved. And uh, I believe it was on the night that the Paris Agreement was approved. Um, and then I went um, with a number of fellow journalistic colleagues, we went into a bar. And there was one journalist from Argentina and he was like, ah, oh, you are Russian, Nazdorovia. And I said, look, I was so tired. It was like 1 a.m. And I said, look, we don't say Nazdorovia. And he's like, what do you say then? And I was so tired to explain him all of that. Then I just said, you know what, let's just say Nazdorovia. <laughs> like, no. I think that was very important to just get on the record. <laughs> Finally. Nazdorovia, no, and also, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, many other things. Young people don't really drink vodka. Um, hardly anyone wears fur hats anymore. <laughs> what else? Bears don't walk down the streets. Sometimes, they, like in Siberia, you would spot a bear in the city, but that's like very, very rare. Um, I was at the Kamchatka region of Russia, which is the very far east of the country on the Pacific coast, like overlooking Canada on the other side and um, I was organizing a strategic session on sustainable waste management and uh, like we were doing interviews and we were asking people what is it the waste issues that bother you the most and one of the answers we got there was like if it's a remote south settlement or if it's like outskirts of the city very often bears come to waste containers and they start like roaming in these waste containers <laughs> like what bears <laughs> like for us it was as exotic as probably for you 
but sometimes that happens. So I would not take bears completely off the picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, can I ask you what role um, does Russia see itself as having in terms of climate protection? You mentioned it's a huge topic. People are really interested and invested in it at the moment. And uh, what role does Russia play and, and what role does it see itself having? Well, I guess I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of Russia because I'm not a public official. I can just mention and say what I see and how I perceive it. Um, when I mentioned that everyone is so interested in environmental issues these days, well, first of all, it can still be my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> and second, um, it's mostly local environmental issues that people are interested in. So like air quality, water quality, green urban areas, waste management. So those would be the topics. Climate change is gradually becoming a more important issue, but very gradually. Also, as people see more negative impacts of climate change from the wildfires in Siberia to mountain permafrost, storms in the cities, droughts in the south and uh, floods in the in the west of the country uh, on the political level uh, russia is acknowledging that there is climate change and uh, it's um, partly anthropogenic cost i mean this is the the, the way they usually form it like formulate it um, they uh, the politicians acknowledge that there are risks resulting for russia from negative impacts of climate change and something needs to be done. So like we need to adapt to the climate change, negative consequences. And um, Russia is also more and more realizing that its economy is very much dependent on fossil fuels extraction and exports. So uh, efforts, decarbonization efforts of other countries will certainly influence Russia's economy and uh, in its current structure. Uh, it can come in the form of uh, lesser demand for fossil fuels or other carbon intensive goods. Or it can also come in, in a form of, um, say, border carbon regulation mechanisms. Like the European Union, as part of the Green Deal, is uh, considering introducing the so-called carbon border adjustment mechanism. And that has been widely and very intensely discussed in Russia over the last year and still now, because it's obviously uh, has, will have a huge impact on Russian experts. So those topics are very much discussed and uh, I would say very even popular within the media and political context. However, on the other side, um, discussions and talks about mitigation issues, what is that actually that we can do, how we can bring our emissions down, how we can truly decarbonize our economy, give a push to renewable energy, to energy efficiency. Those kinds of discussions are getting m much slower and there are many hurdles to it on various levels, financial, bureaucratic, administrative, but also pressure from uh, various lobby groups. So that part of the climate agenda is not going so smoothly as the climate risk ad adaptation one, I would say so. Okay, and um, you recently um, wrote an article in February um, about uh, the aims for uh, net zero planet heating emissions by 2025 that have been imposed or planned um, in a specific region in Russia. What, what's that project about? Um, can you maybe just tell us what's going on there? Because it does sound um, incredibly important and ambitious. Well, I will actually be going to that region in April to learn more about that experiment. It's just been launched, so we don't have many more details rather than what has been mentioned in that article, which I wrote for the Thomson Reuters Foundation. But it's um, Sakhalin Island, which is once again located at the very far east of Russia in Pacific Ocean, and not that far from Japan. and. Um, on that island, uh, there's quite a lot of oil and gas and coal exploration, and also many international players like Shell are active in uh, oil and gas projects in the area. And I believe because it's an island and because they already have some um, renewable energy, like th um, thermal energy, like uh, geothermal energy and other uh, kinds of renewable energy, 
they felt like maybe they could try and be one of these pilot regions in Russia, which could develop uh, emissions trading and which could also develop uh, green and blue hydrogen production and launch uh, hydrogen trains on an island. So there are a lot of plans, there are a lot of uh, big words, and there are a lot of goals, including a goal to become 100% uh, zero net, um, yeah, like carbon neutral by net zero by 2025. Uh, we'll see. I mean, so far, I feel like it's good that something is happening. It's good that there are thoughts about it. It's good that something is being planned. We still have to see how it's been realized on the practical level and what kind of results will be uh, achieved. Still, I would also say it's something which even a few years ago, which would be completely unthinkable. So I feel like now it's good that at least it's getting there and there are people interested in um, decarbonization and reaching carbon neutrality and people interested in developing of renewable energy and green hydrogen production. And um, let's hope that it will at least have some kind of result, uh, which I will also be then um, uh, able to write about. Thank you so much for um, being here today, Angelina. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I've learned an incredible amount uh, about you, about Russia and just generally about what you think uh, about life. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you, Annika. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed this inspiring conversation and will tune in again for more next time. This podcast is brought to you by the World Future Council, a foundation that identifies, develops, highlights and disseminates future just solutions for the current challenges that humanity is facing. To support our work, find us at www.worldfuturecouncil.org as well as on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and, of course, in our next episode.